Up for review today, we have the Cali LP6 Second Wave. Now, the benefit of the second wave is a lower noise floor and increased sensitivity on the inputs, but also there's a lot more DSP built into this that allows the response to be more flat on axis than the previous version. And looking at it, you can see you've got a six and a half inch woofer, a one inch dome tweeter with an elliptical shaped waveguide and a nice slot port up front. And on the back, if you flip it around, we've got RCA inputs. You've got quarter inch TRS input, and then you have an XLR input. You've got a gain knob that allows you to adjust sensitivity if you need to. And then you've also got a series of dip switches that allows you to set the speaker up in different environments. So you can set it freestanding, you can set it on a console. You also have the option for bass boost or cut, and the same thing for treble boost or cut. Now, as I go through this data, if you're unsure what the results mean, I'll throw a card at the top. You can follow my playlist to understand what the results mean. Yeah, that's it. Okay, cool. One thing to note, these speakers were loaned to me by Cali Audio and I'm doing the review. They have not seen this review. They know nothing of it as of right now. So they will see it at the same time the rest of the public does. Here we have the CEA 2034 results for the Cali LP6 second wave or 6V2, if you want to call it that which I am calling it that. The on-axis response is pretty linear. Uh, it does have a little bit of a bump right through here. So at first, you know, my eyes go to this and say that there's a recess and then there's a recess here. But the more you look at it, the more I find that actually what's going on is there's a bump right around the one to two kilohertz region. When I looked at the horizontal response data, I didn't see any really any bad effects from that. It turns out it's from the vertical response. And that's what's really kind of driving your directivity to be wonky right in that area. Uh, so if you kind of can overlook that and you think about it in terms of horizontal response, this speaker really is incredible. But again, the vertical response is what's causing some of these things to be a little bit, as I said, wonky. Uh, if you sit above or below the tweeter line, then you're going to have some issue. But as long as you're sitting right on axis with the tweeter line, it's not an issue. And for the price of 400 bucks per pair, I think that that's a reasonable request for the manufacturer to make. Uh, the estimated interim response shows a pretty reasonably linear slope. I mean, there's some little areas, again, as I mentioned, that one to two kilohertz area and a mild plateau in the high frequency range. Uh, I got to say that when I was listening to the speaker, I thought it just sounded great. And I did take some of this data and I went into it with this in mind and I did some EQing. I dropped down the one, I think it was one and a six, one and a half kilohertz, somewhere around that area. Uh, and I didn't really feel like that made a positive change, but what did make a positive change for me, at least to my ears, was bumping up the eight kilohertz region by about a dB and a half. That brought some shimmer to uh, cymbals, and it brought a little bit of air to the overall soundstage, if you want to call it that. That's what I noticed by adding just a little bit of EQ to kind of sprinkle to my taste. And there's a pun in there if you guys are paying attention. Uh, that's what, I, that's what I did, and that's what I really enjoyed about the speaker is it responds well to equalization. And the reason it responds well to equalization is because the horizontal off-axis response is really quite great. This is the horizontal response as you go from on-axis to off-axis. And what we see here is that, I mean, it's just a nice, nice good trend throughout. You don't see any abrupt changes. I mean, you do see some linearity changes here but it tracks pretty well off axis. you got a little bit of a bunch up right there. So that's going to be my guess as to probably diffraction through this area, but I'm not entirely sure. That also could be where the tweeter is being brought in and it could be a little bit more omnidirectional than the mid range is at this particular point. But overall, you know, I'm not going to harp on this too much because not only is it still really good, it's really, really, really good for the price. I mean, it's $400 powered studio monitors and I don't know if it can be beat. Now the vertical response is where we start to see some of the issues that drove the directivity index being a little bit out of whack, again, through that one to two kilohertz area. On axis is the dark red here, and it looks quite good. Uh, the lighter colored red is solid line, looks pretty good. Dash line, you know, it's starting to drop more a little bit through this uh, one and a half to two and a half kilohertz region. And as you go further away from the tweeter level, the more uh, irregular the response becomes. So stay on the tweeter level. 
This is the on-axis response linearity, and the mean is just calculated based on a range from 300 hertz to three kilohertz. Now, this being a powered speaker, you can pretty much ignore the SPL area. Stay within these lines. The gray line is plus or minus one and a half dB, and this speaker pretty much rolls right through there. I mean, it's pretty dang good. Uh, the blue line is a plus or minus three dB window, and you almost don't even need it for this particular speaker. The one thing I do really want to note is this F3 is at 42 hertz. That's really low. I, I'm happy with most speakers if they get down to 50 or 60 hertz, but this speaker gets even below 50 hertz. And then if you put them in a room against a wall, that'll help shore up the bass a little bit more. You might still want to sell over just because the roll off is so steep, but I think for the majority of people, you'll be happy with the speaker, especially for those of you who are mixing. Now, if you're using this for like home audio or something, you don't want to sit too far away and try to get too much volume out of it. And I'll show you why below. This graphic shows you what happens as you increase the volume from 76 dB up to 86, 96, and 102 dB. And as you can see in the purple line, the 102 dB, the response is quite varied from the 76 dB baseline. But at 86 dB and even at 96 dB, you're within a reasonable amount of, uh, I would say, SPL loss for what this speaker is, again, given that it's supposed to be a near field to mid field, which I think they spec at 0.5 meters to two and a half meters. For a stereo pair, I wouldn't expect you to run into any considerable issues, especially as long as you're listening at a reasonable volume level at about 80 dB. You should have a 20 dB peak or so for dynamic range and still be okay there. On the back, there's a series of dip switches that allow you to tailor the sound to your specific needs. It has tweeter level as well as bass level. And then it also has some settings for console or up against the wall or freestanding. So I provided you a couple examples below. And what you really want to pay attention to are the tweeter level. So if you wanted to bring the tweeter level up 2 dB, that would be this red. Now this dark blue right here in the middle, that's your baseline tweeter setting. And then this cyan color is negative 2 dB on the tweeter. And then let's see what else we got here. This dark blue on the lower end is on a table greater than a half meter and then the green would be on a console so this kind of gives you an idea of what the dsp is doing when you make changes on the dip switches overall i think this is a no-brainer recommendation 400 bucks for the pair they sound great there's a couple little things that i personally would change on the eq and if you're producing or mixing or something like that you certainly have the ability to do that or you may just find that you don't necessarily want those changes that I would recommend. But the cool thing about it is with the performance of the speaker, you can certainly make those changes and still have a good sound. So you're not just changing the on-axis sound only, you're changing the rest of the sound that goes out into the room, and that's a good thing. There's no hiss in the speaker that I heard. I had it about three feet or so away from me for the most part, and I never heard any issues. I was running it off of a Motu M2 sound card, using Apple iTunes, streaming music into that and uh, no issues at all there. So, you know, it's just a great speaker in my opinion. And again, I do highly recommend it if you're looking at this review and considering making the purchase. And in case this thing ever pops up on Amazon, I will drop an affiliate link at that point in time, but for now, no such link exists. So if you wanna just Google it, you can go about it that way. Uh, also, if you are not subscribed to this channel and you like what I'm doing here, please hit the thumbs up button and make sure you subscribe, that would be cool. And I will talk to you later, take care, peace.